Welcome to my world. Two escargot, pate, frise, two green salads. Okay, that is what here. Lamb chop, steak free. Shouldn't you be doing something? Two faux filet and a pepper steak. Come on, make the dessert. Chocolate tart, please. As a cook, tastes and smells are my memories. And now I'm in search of new ones. So I'm leaving New York City and hope to have a few epiphanies around the world. And I'm willing to go to some lengths to do that. I am looking for extremes of emotion and experience. I'll try anything. I'll risk everything. I have nothing to lose. Our experience in Portugal was very much a step back in time. Open fires, hearths, fireplaces. And of course, the food is very much like it was 100, 200 years ago. And they're proud of it. It's mind-boggling. You feel like you're in another century. Here I am, finally, in Portugal. What's different about Portugal than every place else? Basically, in Portugal, we eat a lot of fish. And then we eat a lot of pork. And one of the great things is that any animal, we eat just about everything. We don't let anything go to waste. Nose to From tail. The nose to tail, all the innards, everything. You're scaring me. I'm going to Portugal to figure out Jose, my boss from Leal, the restaurant where I work. Jose is a maniacal foodie. Loves food, loves cooking, loves talking about food, loves buying food. And his love for his country's cuisine has only gotten stronger since he left Portugal years ago. Jose's quirky obsession with Portuguese food is something that's always intrigued me. And knowing Jose, I suspect I'm going to be eating a lot here. Prepare the stomach for lunch. <laughs> the town of Oporto. It's an old town. It's a pretty town. How old is the city? Uh, maybe from the 12th century, as, as we know it. As, right. As being part of Portugal, so it's a very, very old city. We quickly discover possibly the most important traditional staple of Portuguese cuisine which is salt cod, or bacalhau, as they call it here. OK, this is the backbone of Portuguese cuisine, isn't exactly. it? This is what it's all about. Why is that? Uh, I guess there used to be a lot of bacalhau in North Atlantic. And the Portuguese boat, at the time, uh, nobody cares about. The Portuguese fishermen would go to the North Atlantic, up to the Greenland, to fish for bacalhau. Right. And they figured out a way to preserve it, both on the boat and then when it gets in land. Right. Because at the time, right. there's no freezers. No, no refrigeration so, at all. Back in the days when Portugal ruled the world, way before Swanson Hungry Man frozen dinners, they needed a sustainable food for all those long conquering boat trips. And they discovered that if they splayed out a cod and stuck it in salt, it would last a couple of years. That's a long time at sea. But what started out as survival food soon made its way onto their tables back home and hasn't left since. People started falling in love with bacalhau and it becomes the basic, if there is a national dish, there will be bacalhau. Now I understand why you don't like that stuff that comes with no bones in it in the little exactly. plastic bag. Well, like any food crazy country, restaurants are known for specific dishes or specific things that they do well. And apparently Portugal has a lot of these joints. I'm sure you'll have some things for us to eat while waiting for the fish head to get cooked. You will see what... Uh, oh, man, and I'm ready. The first place Jose takes us is a workaday lunch joint called Redondo. Redondo is famous for Merluza, particularly head of Merluza. If you don't know the owner, if you're not a friend of the owner, if you don't come here often, you cannot have the head. The head is reserved for the really special customers. Well, fortunately, we're very special people. <laughs> it should be pointed out, you don't make reservations for the night. You basically make them for life. This is your cousin's table? Yeah, this is my cousin's he table right here. He owns this table. Okay. <laughs> I know there's some elements of, of Portuguese cuisine that I already really, really like. And in fact, I've stolen a lot of those recipes and, and used them as my own over the years. So I'm here because I like the idea of just using every part to really understand how every part is valued. You know, you respect the ingredients. That's sort of the antithesis of what we do in the States. When you think sardine in the States, this is not the same animal at all. Not salty, oily, stinky like we're used to. These are really good, really fresh, and in this case, dredged in flour and eaten whole. You start by that. This is everything I like in food. Absolutely nothing is wasted. You've got the whole thing, the whole fish. It's simple, it's straightforward. There's about, you know, what, two, three ingredients involved, and it's good because it's good. You don't have to, to, to carve it into a silly shape, and you can eat the head. <laughs> I think these days I see more and more people want to simple, you know, good. ingredients, fresh. very good, very fresh. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Oh, here we go. Next, Merluza. 
Merluza is like a giant whiting, very simple, very rustic. The Portuguese understand that the closer to the bone, the sweeter the meat. You know, they cut it further down the neck, so we have right, a, little, so we a little meat to it. So. I got all the good stuff here. The cheek, the tongue, little boiled potato, carrot, onion. You want die ball too? Yeah. I love some. Um, yeah, I'd love some. Yeah. It's really light, really subtle flavor, ethereal, one might say. Basically, if you like filet fish, you will like eyeball. Just you got to get past your preconceptions about uh, chewing on eyeballs. Now for the tongue, the tripe a la mode. I love making. I think I make it pretty well, but it smells like uh, wet sheepdog to me. Jose just loves tripe. He not only loves tripe, he likes tripe cooked in beans, preferably with some hooves and some knuckles and some blood sausage and some skin and some ears and some tails. That's something I probably would not have ordered had I come to this restaurant alone. This is the best type of tripe. It's called the tripe frisé. See the beans, and there's a little, uh, we call mont de vaca. That's the, the cow's feet there. It's the best. Okay. Yeah, this dish is, uh, the reason it's called uh, Oporto style. In some time in history, Napoleon sent his troops and he, he did invade Portugal. And he ransacked everything, so people surrender. But they left them with the innards of the, of the animals. That was the tribe, the stomach of the cows and maybe some other things. And the people from Oporto came up with a dish that was the tribes to survive. And of course, then become a traditional big dish. Okay, where's that little veal feet piece? Oh, here it is. See, I would be a full-blown tripe fan if I'd been eating it like this all the time. Good. Right, kid. Let's go. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful uh, and eye-opening experience. It should be pointed out. I've been off the plane, what, two hours now? I've had no sleep. I'm jet-lagged. This man is enthusiastic to a fever pitch. Some drawstring pants might have been a good investment before this trip because I get the idea I'm going to be eating a lot and I'm going to be eating frequently. The city of Oporto. It's a port city. It's in northern Portugal at the mouth of the Douro River. It's a city that grew up around the making of, exporting of, port wine. The grapes may come from the Douro Valley, but this is port town. Now you are on the Corribeira. It's probably the most typical part of Oporto. You see all the port wine signs, most of the familiar brands, uh, Cullen, uh, Sandman, De La Force. Right, I recognize some of these names. So this is what all happens in terms of uh, port wine. This is the, the center of the whole, right. of the whole business of port. The wine so, came from upriver? Yes, come upriver. river. On these then, boats? Then on these boats, then here, they would fortify it with brandy, and then it sailed down to England. During one of their many scuffles with the French, the shifty British turned to Portugal for their wine, but found they could only keep it from going bad during shipment by adding brandy. And bingo, they invented port wine. The result was that you look around the river and you see a number of decidedly un-Portuguese names. See, if you'd poured a few hundred, a couple of hundred years ago, if you'd poured a few hundred thousand gallons of port into the river, thrown a little port party, and yeah. then started killing a few thousand Englishmen, maybe you wouldn't have had this problem. Well, maybe. <laughs> Well, let's go in there. It's really, really very nice. So in old days, they used to have taverns and stores, and some of them still have, still have some taverns here. The Portuguese are sort of defiantly happy about not having changed much at all. They seem to have decided early on what's good and stuck with it. Here, you have a very old-style grocery store. Let's, up, let's maybe on the side, maybe it'll be open. Yeah, it's open. So this is, this is what the grocery store used to look like. And then years ago, so there's nothing changing here. You see, you know, the olives, the tremosos, the brown, you know, all these ingredients, and it's the same style, you know, that people used to go and buy their supplies. We're going to eat some octopus next. Jose has been telling me all about this place for some time. People come from all over Portugal to eat octopus here. What's the name of this restaurant? Uh, it's called Aleixo, and as you know, it's very well known for his octopus rice and uh, octopus filets. Joining us for octopus is Jerry Looper, a winemaker from California who settled in Portugal about seven years ago okay. to grow grapes and to make new wine. Sit down with the food on the table and wine. Ah, oh, that's good. That's where it has to be. This is another form of octopus, you know. This octopus salad. The octopus is boiled, then mixed with a little vinaigrette. Little bacalao balls, like meatballs, only cod. I knew I'd be eating a lot of bacalao because I just know Jose's obsessed with this stuff. He gets very upset if what he sees as substandard bacalao comes into the restaurant. He'd come in, look at it, and say, send it back. I hate it. I can't live with it. Would it be fair to say that this is one of Porto's most beloved restaurants? Yes, yes. By locals? 
and by foreigners and, and by a yes. destination. If you really want to bring someone to savor the local food and really enjoy what is good and typical about the port, that's the place to this, bring. This is it. Yeah. Jerry, you're going to tell us what we're drinking here with this. Pork and Morso Reserva Branco, white wine partially fermented in barrel and uh, then blended with wine fermented in stainless steel for freshness and butteriness of the wood. And, uh, very agreeable with this kind of food. I don't know shit about wine. I should not be counted on to recommend a good vintage. Fortunately, Jerry Looper knows everything about wine. That'll come in handy tomorrow. Look how she cuts the potatoes without even looking. Yeah, huh? These guys are great. This is a special dose. Like 90% of the people they came here for this only. <laughs> okay, Tony. Tell me what we got here. This is Dr. Puss rice. They make with a smaller piece of the tentacles. Right in with the rice? Yeah. And here you have octopus fillets. It's very difficult to find somewhere else. All right. First of all, they use fresh octopus that is fished locally. And second, that's what this restaurant is famous for. And they've been doing this for 40, 50 years at least. So it's very, very hard to do something as well as they do. This is an operation that figured out what it is they wanted to do, exactly. figured out what they do well, and have been doing it relentlessly for I years. Mean, exactly. So you want a piece of prosciutto? Uh, of course. Didn't I just see one hanging up on a wall somewhere? Yeah, right yes. Looking good. Tell us about this cheese. Cheap smoked cheese, south of Lisbon. Stubal. Okay, so this is just how I like it, meaning this rind breaks, this stuff is uh, seeking its own level. I'm frequently asked, you know, why vegans are, are the enemy of everything that is good and decent and must be hunted down and destroyed so their genes don't pass on to future generations. It's because if you can't enjoy even a nice, stinky, runny, ripe cheese like this, you may as well kill yourself now. Now, I have to ask you, does every Portuguese meal end with pork? There is no wine on the table. <laughs> it's, it's a disaster. There's no meal. There's no meal, so... I like Portugal. I like the food. But I'm very aware of the fact that this is not like cooking. Thank you. And of course, at the end of the day, I'm stuffed like an over-jammed kielbasa. Salud. Salud. I am out of my league here. The next morning, I wake up on an idyllic mountaintop in the Douro Valley wine country in a spectacular hilltop guest house courtesy of my friend Jerry Looper. And I'm really looking forward to soaking up the amazing view of the vineyards below. But the weather has different plans. As you can see, the weather's not so great. It was actually wonderful, but the staff has informed us uh, with very worried looks that, uh, to the Americans, you should leave very, very soon as the road, uh, no good. We'll hit the road before it washes out, or we'll be living up here for the next six months, I'm told. That doesn't look good. What the hell is this? This isn't like my travel agent told me. This is like Escape from Witch Mountain, the R-rated version. At some point, we're going to go meet that evil Jerry guy who uh, sent us up to this mountaintop in the first place. Hey, his wine better be good. Jerry, uh, thanks for uh, getting us off the mountaintop there. I love touch and go for a while. <laughs> Any uh, chilling anecdotes of <laughs> hapless tourists marooned up here? Well, in as, as a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, uh, down on the main highway, a huge chunk of a hill fell down and submerged two cars that were passing by. So we do okay. need to get down the hill. Just a little background on the Doro. There are 40,000 hectares. That's 96,000 acres of grapes. And there are 33,000 owners of vineyards in that area. Wow. Down here, you have the Doro River uh, upstream on the way to Spain. And the vineyards continue for another 20, 30 miles up the river. This has been wine country going back hundreds and hundreds of years. Oh, yeah. And there's evidence that the Romans were here for gold. Named the river Doro of right. gold. The Romans mined gold here, and then when the gold ran out, they stayed and uh, made wine. You know, that was one of the Roman ways of keeping things settled down, and to keep the local people happy. Keep them liquored up. Uh, Works in my kitchen. I didn't know wine country was so steep. <laughs> I, I pictured, you know, uh, gently uh, rolling hills. Yeah, here it's very steep. But routinely, you'll find slopes of 45 degrees. 45 degrees, if you look at the angle like that, that's right. pretty darn that's steep. Okay, this vineyard is called Cartola, and uh, the vines are about 70, 80 years old, and they produce the wine we're going to drink with dessert uh, after lunch. As we can see, uh, the water and erosion has caused a break in the wall here. We got rock blocking the drainage. It's a constant battle to keep this in conditions, and it uh, takes a lot of work, a lot of labor. From about where we're standing to the tree line over there, 
How many cases of wine are we, uh, best case scenario? Okay, if we're talking about maybe, say, 35 cases per acre times five, um, you know, 165 cases of wine from two hectares. That's not very much. Still, think about that next time you uh, tuck into a really good wine. Well, I think we came to the end of the road here. Jerry's uh, yammering on about there. vines and soil and rain. Meanwhile, I'm hoping that the road doesn't wash out and that I don't go tumbling to my death in a tangle of Land Rover parts and grapevines. This is a thin strip of uh, road we're on here. Safe at the bottom of the mountain, we arrive at the Quinta, the main farmhouse on the vineyard. OK. Wine is on, dry white port. Let's see what you think of this one. And a lot of people use it to make um, uh, a cocktail in the summertime with some tonic, ice, and peel of orange. You know, there's a classic rock and roll song called White Port and Lemon Juice. I yeah. said W A P Boom LJ. Boom L J. It's from my time. <laughs> Okay, the kitchen is ready. It's nice to have these almonds and wine, but it's time to get into the real thing. Jerry's got something special in mind for lunch, bacalhau. There seem to be many, many ways to make it. It's a constant theme. It's called bacalhau con nata. So it's, a, it's almost like a brandade uh, yeah. casserole, but it's a heartier texture, consistency, and a nice crunchy top. And you know, as they say in France, there's a cheese for every day. In Portugal, there's a bacalhau recipe for every day. Yeah, we're noticing it's cod, cod, cod. Oh. And the wine we're serving is a 1997 Chardonnay. And uh, hope it goes OK with the bacalhau. Next, a roast loin of pork stuffed with prunes, roasted, unsurprisingly, in port wine. The French call this boulanger potatoes, meaning you cook the potatoes with the roast, so you get all that fatty, greasy goodness. That's beautiful. And here's the secret, the mold, you know, the juice. Is... Okay, well, I'm going to have to have that plate back. <laughs> <laughs> and today you peel the potatoes, the batatas. You go to mais com a casca. You know, there's this thing, peeled or not peeled? I know, it's, an, it's, it's the eternal struggle, isn't it? Right. The cook never wins, anyway. <laughs> Double starch. Potato, rice. It's a thing at like Culinary Institute of America, you know, where, where certain precepts are drilled into you, that you, know, you must do this this way. And I guess I found out that at least 75 to 90% of those precepts are absolutely wrong. <laughs> okay, this is a Tintero Rich, and it has a good amount of tannin, which really goes great with a meat dish. <laughs> now, something very special. 40-year-old Tony Port, 40 years old. This wine started its life with, with this color. And then this time, it changes to a lovely almond orange. Wow. Well, there must be blood and bone involved, because <laughs> you're looking to move beyond the grape into the spiritual sense. You know, I'm getting life force here. <laughs> I'm getting drunk. And uh, remember those vines I showed you? We passed Nicole's this neighborhood, as I recall. Yes. Those grapes went into this one. Wonderful. I consider myself a professional drinker. But if this keeps up, I'm not going to make it out of Portugal. You know, like much of my time in Portugal, I have no idea where the hell I'm going. Jose says, we're going someplace very good to eat baby goat. We arrive at Quinta de Lama. It means mud farm. I don't know why. So Jose, we took some uh, sinister looking dark back roads to get here. I could never find my way out. Uh, where are we exactly? The old olive oil uh, press. Uh, as you can see, it is all made in stone. They used to put the olives, and this will will come around and smash the olives. So this is not working anymore, and they decided to transform this into a countryside restaurant. The famous here for kid goat, roasted the traditional Portuguese way. So they come here in the kitchen, and uh, this is still the original kitchen. As you can see, the uh, old wood burning uh, fire is there. Actually, our goat is in here. Really? It's cooking here. So do you see this seal here? Yeah. Uh, used to seal this with cow manure. That's mm. right. Can be legal. I'll, I'll live so with this. <laughs> this is the way people smoke the sausage. They hang up over here over some kind of open fire, and they are here getting smoke. This is seriously old school. Jose has a very extended family. Every 10 minutes, somebody else enters the room, and it's, this is my cousin, this is my brother, this is my cousin. <laughs> actually, this is uh, one of my cousins. is a very important person to meet, because he actually is the CEO of a company that fish for bacalhau. Oh, yeah. we know how important that is. So maybe some of the bacalhau that you're eating so far might have been fished by his boats. Hello. After four hours of slow cooking, my little baby goat is ready to hit the table. Here it is. 
Oh, yeah. You it's know, the rice is underneath, so the, the drippings will come over the rice. That's what makes it very tasteful. Grease gets in there, yeah. all that nice flavor. So now we can start eating. <laughs> Let's eat. Like so many places in Portugal, it's the old way. We're talking real flame, real smoke, real flavor. Every single Portuguese meal, you have to start with codfish. I'm gathering that. Another festive casserole of bacalhau. There doesn't seem to be much dilution yes. of the original concept. Before there was restaurant food, there was home cooking. It's all about friends and family. Yeah, give me a little grease there. And good local stuff with a long tradition attached to it. Oh, incredible. I don't fully understand Portuguese cuisine, but I understand why José is José a little more now. The context for José's particular form of enthusiasm and madness. Generally, when he's passionate about a food item, it's because it comes from his childhood. And that's true of all of us. I think any dish that evokes memory that you grew up with has a powerful hold on you. And José is José because he's never forgotten that.